Guys, I've got something extremely awesome for you today. I am sitting down with the great Ed A. Bourne, the drummer for 80s heavy metal band Siren. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much for having me on, man. I've been looking forward to this. Siren, after, what, 30 years? 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> they are back in action, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Now, before we dive in, Siren does have a new album out, Back from the Dead, that they released in 2020. That's right. And you also have a documentary called I'm Too Old for This Shit, a heavy metal fairy tale about our unexpected reunion and journey to play at the Keep It True Festival uh, in Germany. And it was an incredible experience. And this was produced by wrestler, pro wrestler Chris Jericho. Yeah, amazing guy. Just, yeah. you know, so talented on so many levels. And he saw as we were going through this, he recognized that it was going to be an incredible story. And either whether it was horrible ending or a great ending, <laughs> he knew it would be something he wanted to see. So it now it, it's a thing. And guys, we're going to dive very deep into that. There's some interesting details that we're going to share with you that I was going to share with you towards the end of the video. So make sure you hang around for that. Yeah. Also, just to let you guys know, the links to the album, the latest album, Back from the Dead, and the documentary are in the YouTube description of this video. So, Ed, I want to act like we're at Blockbuster, the old VHS tape place, and yeah. rewind. I want to click the rewind button, okay. and I want to go all the way back and just ask, what's what's the thing that got you into heavy metal music? Like, what was your inspiration? What was the reason you got into that style? Right. I started actually, as so many others at the time, uh, Kiss. It came down to Kiss. I was 11, 12 years old in the um, mid-70s. And a friend turned me on to Kiss. And, you know, when you see that as a 12-year-old, it just blows your mind. I mean, the the music, the power, the, the stage show, everything. And uh, it just lit that fire inside of me that said, this is something that looks like it's really, really fun to do. So uh, that's what kind of started it. And then I, uh, I had a friend who was awesome to Kiss, someone who very much into Kiss. And he turned me on to the playing drums because he had a drum set and I would go over sometimes and bang around on his kit. And I was like, this is the part that reaches me. That's the part that, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the guitar, you know, or singing. And I can't sing anyway. So that made that choice. <laughs> that choice was made for me. But uh, playing the drums, it was just something magical. And so uh, when I was 13, I got my own kit for Christmas, oh, you nice. know, the top tier brand, you know, Zimgar. Simgar. Yeah. So, but it's a drum kit, and for a thirteen-year-old me, it was like, "This is it. This is real." Yeah. And started playing along with the Kiss records, and you know that just kind of took off from there. And my my musical tastes over the years then kind of wandered a little bit, and I I discovered heavy metal probably when I was fifteen. Uh, another oh, wow. friend who was someone in the area who was just the guy you go to to find out about new music yeah. uh, named Dee Vinoy. He would just get music from all over the world and turn us on to it. And uh, I discovered Rush and Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and Riot. And then I was like, oh, this is, this is that same feeling. It's that next yeah. level that ignites that passion again and just cranks it up. It's like, this is what I want to play. So that's how I found myself, you know, being a metal fan. And it kind of set my taste for that traditional, you know, new wave of British heavy metal yeah, yeah. kind of melodic vocals like Halford and Dickinson. I love Halford, too. Oh, yeah. Over the music that had a real strong beat. It wasn't, yeah. you know, music was still evolving at that time. Metal, there weren't so many subgenres, you know. So it was just that powerful, you know, that beat that just gets into you. And, and it, it hooked me, you yeah, know, totally. And especially Priest. I remember the first time I heard Judas Priest and then bands like Maiden, that, that mm. new wave of British metal. Mm. Something just happens inside. Absolutely. And like the, those of us like us who love that style of music, when we hear it for the first time, it's like, oh, I found my calling in life. Oh, it was incredible. <laughs> I put the needle down on Unleashed in the East. Yeah. And Exciter kicked off with that double bass. And it just, you know, it just was like, oh, you know, just a revelation. Yeah. So it was, it, that's how I got there. So you started out of the gate, you're, you've got all this really cool metal, and you're starting to play drums. You've mm -hmm. got this, whatever it's called, drum kit. <laughs> <laughs> Zimgar. Yeah. Now, how did how did you get into Siren? How did Siren start? When, when did all this come about? Okay, it was uh, around the same time, a little bit before, uh, I mean, I had discovered metal, got into that, Ozzy, you know, that was another thing. Yes. And then yes. we have the group of friends, of course, that, you know, are into that same kind of music, and... 
you gravitate to that, go to a couple concerts. And then when you, especially when you go to a concert and you see it live, you're like, let's do that. You know, let's do that yes. now. <laughs> and so we formed an early band. It wasn't Siren. Um, it was, uh, you know, and of course, band names are all important. Of course. So sticking <laughs> with the Judas Priest theme, you know, it's like we, we might as well go for the top of this mountain with our name. So we started with Metal Gods. Metal Gods. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think we, we backed down the ego a little bit once yeah. we hurt ourselves and changed to Deceiver, another priest title. But it was nice. like, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, my friend Frank Marsh, he was the singer, yeah. and I were in this band... Um, Deceiver, and the cousin of our guitarist had uh, his own band, but they were five years older than us, so they were like okay. the big guys, you know. We were we were just 16, you know, 15, 16 at the yeah. time, but they were all 20, 21, so uh, they had formed Siren behind the house where we were practicing, basically, oh, wow. yeah. Dude. So uh, Rob Phillips, Hal Dunn, who is our current guitarist. Cool yeah. guy, man, real cool dude. Yeah. And uh, so they, we would hear them practice, and they were playing songs that we couldn't even think of playing. They were playing UFO, oh, and yes, Rob yeah. Phillips, the guitarist, would play Eruption by Eddie Van Halen. And we're just like, wow. You know, you just all, you're in awe of the guys who are yeah. on that next rung. And so we, ha we had our bands in the two backyards. Um, we used to practice in a shed in Lamar's backyard, our guitarist, that was, you know, uh, 10 by 12. Oh wow! Dude. And just ridiculous because <laughs> it's like it's like that's where part of my hearing still resides is yeah. in that shed where I left it, and uh, a day came when um, we were both playing at the same time and we could hear them getting set up, but uh, we noticed that their drummer didn't show up and they didn't really have a good, uh, a vocalist at the time that was that was locked in, so we had finished and. They kind of reached across the fence and said, hey, Ed, you know, and Frank, do you want to come over and jam with us? Cool. Yeah, and we're like, no, yes. Yeah. You know, we don't know if we're <laughs> worthy, but yes. So we did. I brought the kit over, you know, literally over the fence. And nice. um, we started playing some tunes, like I said, like Rock Bottom by UFO and, you know, a couple others, Hellbent for Leather by Priest. Yes. And you know, it felt so great just to be playing the songs that we recognized. And it was, it turned out to be basically kind of almost like an informal audition. And they're like, hey, you know, our drummer is not really into it and we don't have a permanent singer. What would you guys think of just joining the band? Oh, man. And we're like, yeah, yeah. So Siren. that's how I got into Siren. And Siren was formed and that was 1981, which is now, I just realized this the other day, it's 40 years ago this year oh, 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 i know it's years, crazy dude. 40 years ago wow. is when siren was formed in that in that backyard and then uh we just took off from there in terms of starting to try to become more professional going from the backyard yeah. to having a uh a warehouse you know renting a warehouse yeah. back when people who rent warehouse spaces you know uh, didn't know not to rent to a band you know because it turns into <laughs> a party and then, uh, you know, to band houses where the band would rent a house. And, yeah. uh, you know, it just kept going you know, up from there. But that was the genesis of Siren now 40 years ago. Wow, man. So at what point did you guys get to that level where you're actually playing shows, you, you've written some music, and you're actually playing out and, and doing that sort of thing? Because you guys were starting to really climb up. I know there's a mm -hmm. lot of awesome things that happened after this. Yeah, we, this is so in the early 80s. Now we're talking like 82, 83. Yeah. Um, the band still played a lot of covers, lots of Priest, lots okay. of Maiden, lots of Accept, because there were clubs you could go and literally do sets of metal, right. you know, metal covers, which is a foreign concept today, but you could go and, and play, you know, these songs. And of course, we started working in some originals, just a, just a few, but mainly it was still a cover band. Um, and there were, there were also always parties going on, like yeah. virtually every week there'd be a party in a field somewhere or, you know, at a, uh, you know, somebody's house. And uh, that was mainly what the band's focus was, you know, during those years, during, okay. during those years. Um, and then there actually came a point, though, in um, 82, where I had to step aside. Mm. Because uh, in 1982, I had just started my senior year in high school. Okay. And these guys were all five years old, so they're out of school. And I, you know, I'm like, dudes, I can't be playing at a club and then playing an after-hours club until 3 in the morning. Oof. 
you know, or four in the morning and then try to go to school, you know, at six in the morning, seven. So I was like, you know what? I still want to be friends. I love the band. I love everything that's going on, but I'm going to step aside, which I did. And uh, another drummer, you know, a friend of the in that circle kind of stepped in and, and took over and they continued to play. And I just was then a friend hanging out at the house, you know, either sometimes running sound, running lights in the house because it was crazy. We had a full stage at the house and oh, wow, know, yeah yeah it was fun though it was it was a great time but at that point i was you know just not in the band i was yeah. just you know still remained a friend and, and supporter of the band now let me ask how you felt about that though because you're in school mm -hmm. and but every every kid's dream i mean you know mine when i was 18 or whatever it was to be a rock star mm -hmm. and did you feel like maybe that the band wasn't quite going in that direction to you know to stardom, so you're like, well, I better stay in school, or like, how did you make that decision? Because I mean, I know you had to go to school, but right. that's got to be tough, man. Yeah, it was. It was. You know, at that point, it wasn't so much about focusing on the band's original music, though. Okay. Gotcha, so yeah, gotcha. the band wasn't at the point yet where they were going to focus on building a name okay. and building a brand. There were some originals because you can't help but write stuff. Yeah. But oh, yeah. but largely since the scene was playing in clubs and parties where people wanted to hear the songs that they were kind of familiar with, yeah. it was still largely covers. So it wasn't like I was stepping aside at that point to be, and I felt like, man, I've gotten off the train to my ticket. Because that's yeah. the band wasn't on that trajectory yet. They really hadn't gotcha, focused gotcha. on originals. And it wasn't until um, two years later that that ship changed course. Oh, wow. Yeah, so... That's when uh, I had finished high school, gone okay. to college, and during that time, after I'd left to go to college, this was now 83, in early 84, uh, Siren kind of just, you know, they had member changes and they kind of dissolved. They were like, okay, we're tired of playing the clubs, nothing's really, you know, we're having some, you know, conflicts with, with different members, and the guys went into other bands. It just kind of morphed into other bands okay. for the most part. It was around that time that we saw the rise in the fanzine scene and that's okay. magazines that were put out by people uh for the love of metal and music to give uh recognition and publicity and tell people about these up-and-coming bands now the up-and-coming bands that were in these fanzines were metallica and slayer that's crazy and, yeah these were who were in these in these fanzines yeah. because they were they were underground everyone was everyone was still pretty much underground at that point because metal was just starting now to take off in popularity in the U.S. We saw that going on. You know, I saw that. We had another, a friend who was in a band, uh, well, the whole band with our, were our friends, Nasty Savage. Nasty Savage. Nasty yeah. Savage. And they were, they were amazing. They were an incredible band, both musically and, yeah. and performance-wise, and they still are. Um, but the singer, Nasty Ronnie, was also just a complete entrepreneur and businessman, even back then. Awesome. awesome. And he had already started to compile this list of all these fanzines from around the world and these radio stations and magazines. They were ahead of us in that they had already recorded, you know, their demos okay. and was sending it out. And then we would talk and he's like, man, check it out. We're in this magazine now. We're in this magazine. I'm like, ooh, that's something that looks good. We can do that. Yeah. So I talked to our singer, Doug Lee, and the guitarist, Rob Phillips, and said, this is while still at school. I said, hey, what would you think about when I come home for the summer that we record a couple songs and put something out as Siren yeah. and then try to do this? And they were like, absolutely. You know, let's let's go for it. So that's exactly what we did. We I came back. We already had it all planned out. We started to rehearse these songs. We picked two of the songs that were already written yeah. from, you know, back in the, the previous days. I said, all right, let's do something different. So we talked about it. And instead of putting out a cassette, we're like, let's take it next level to kind of stand out and go vinyl. We're going to oh, do our yes. own vinyl. We're going to put out a single, you know, a 45, you know, two song single. Uh, and that's what we aimed for. And that's what we did. We, oh. uh, we did Metro Mercenary and Terrible Swift Sword. Those were the two songs. And put it out on vinyl. And then Ronnie, Nasty Ronnie, nasty Ronnie. said, uh, gave me his list. I mean, just, you know, graciously, just completely without expectation just said, here, I share, because that's the kind of guy I am. Here's my entire list that I worked up. You guys go with it and take off. You know, do, do everything you can, because he's a great guy. And we did. So that's when we started the promotion. And I eventually, like after six months of that, we were getting such good response that I said, all right, let me move back down here to Tampa 
and focus on the band and that's what we did and that's when we really started to put the siren uh, put the effort behind making it a success well, that was a monumental decision though you said hey why don't we why don't we work on our own songs mm -hmm. let's put it out you've got these publications and i remember some of those publications from oh, yeah. back in the day i guess today we call them websites <laughs> yeah exactly they're there yeah. today they would be a website back then they were yeah. actually physically printed magazines sometimes on newsprint sometimes on just regular paper but bound or and you know and there were magazines and you could discover all these bands from around the world and the U.S. that you know you'd never heard of, you wouldn't, because wow. they didn't have records yet. They didn't have deals. That is awesome. So, what was the next step for Siren? I mean, you, you guys probably played some big shows, and and speaking of shows, do you have a favorite show from back then? Is there like a favorite you know show that you guys played where you're playing your original songs that, that's most memorable? Um, I would say you know it was still when we switched gears. Then obviously we got away from playing covers. Yeah, yeah. So we weren't trying to do that. Um, so the shows we would do would be in some of the local clubs or where there were other bands that are playing that might, you know, we might do a double or triple bill or something. Yeah. I would say one of the, the best, you know, remember, most memorable shows uh, was probably Siren playing uh, opening for Sabotage. Oh, at wow. the time, yeah, because wow. they were they were even then they had already had they already got their deal with yeah. Atlantic, and you know so being asked to open for them was just like okay wow and we're they in, yeah. they played in a it was a big club multi level club and wow. hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, so that was you know that was probably the most memorable but really there weren't a lot actually there wasn't really many bands they could pull that kind of people regularly because we're still yeah. fairly local you yeah. know even Sabotage who are a great band. You know, we used to go watch them when they were just coming through the little pub, you know, and yeah. there would be, you know, 40 people just hanging out and yeah. watching them. So everyone was still on that upwards tra uh, trajectory, you know, including us. So it was mostly actually about focusing on that international and, you know, the U.S. scene still at the time yeah. of trying to get to the top of that mountain, which is, of course, a record deal. You just said the magic word, and actually kind of two of them there. One is the deal, and I want to talk about the deal that everybody was chasing back mm -hmm. then, which, you know, rightfully so, that was that was the thing. But I also want to chat briefly, you know, about, uh, you know, about heavy metal in the U.S. versus overseas. So what are your thoughts back then on the deal? I mean, you guys were going hard after that. Right. And did you ever come close to that, that getting that deal, or what happened there? Yeah, yeah, we we. we we pushed hard, you know, and we, we got a lot of great response. I mean, we got, you know, we had correspondence and coverage virtually in, I mean, all the European countries and, yeah, wow. you know, England, South America. I mean, it was it was incredible. We used to actually have a big map, uh, you know, a big world map, yeah. you know, wall map that we would put little flag pins in to say, all right, we got a letter from this guy. Somebody oh, in, in wow. South America ordered the single. Somebody yeah. in, you know, Finland ordered the single. So we really built that up over the the years from after um, first recording the single. We actually went and recorded another demo to keep the ball rolling, keep yeah. new music going out. Um, a demo called Iron Coffins, which is about the German submarines back in the day, oh, you know, cool. in World War Two. Cool, Rob, man. our guitarist, was a big history buff, so... Yeah. Um, but yeah, what we found, to get back to your question, was that at the time, the U.S. was still pretty much rabid for metal. That was yeah, that we were yeah. coming up into that those glory years of metal, you know, in the 80s, the mid 80s through the end of the decade. But Europe and the other parts of the world were something else. We, we could even tell it then. We just, yeah. yeah, it was like, OK, this is where it, it's getting crazy. Yeah. So we, we could tell even back then that the difference between our U.S. market and the, the the rest of the world was something unique, and you know we got a lot of correspondence from countries like Germany, and uh, U.K. and the Scandinavian countries, wow. which was really cool because you know we get got to remember this is all snail mail, so the process <laughs> was you know we have our bio, we put the bio in the yeah. single, uh, a picture like an eight by ten, put it in an envelope, send it out to one of these magazines, and then. You know, then you get you wait months. You hope for the best, right? Yeah, you wait months to see if anything <laughs> comes back, and then sometimes you get that package back that has a page out of the magazine, like photocopied or an actual copy of the magazine, and there you are. And man, I'll tell you what: when you open, you know, a magazine like Art Shock, which is still going today, yeah. or something, and you 
you open up and there's your picture oh, and there's your mm-hmm. review about your music and it's a good review. Um, <laughs> a good yeah, review. <laughs> yeah. uh, there, it's nothing like it. That you know throws so much fuel on the fire to yeah. drive you to that next level that uh, you know it just keeps going and that's what we did. You know, we kept going and it was all about getting that deal. Like I said, you know that's that's what we we're going for. There were a couple lineup changes in um, late '85. Okay. where our guitarist Rob Phillips and bass player uh, Ed Hauser had stepped aside uh, and we got a couple new guys had come in who had come into the circle and recorded our third demo, which would be our last demo, called Dead of Night. Dead of Night. Yeah, Dead yeah. of Night. And it was, uh, by that time, we were practicing and rehearsing these songs six days a week. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it was just full time. It's a job, yeah. It was, because we had no real other job jobs, maybe some menial things, but nothing, it wasn't like we were in careers or anything. Yeah. And we had worked and worked and worked and got those songs so tight that by the time we went into the, into the studio, they were honed, they were polished, as they should be, because back then, you paid by the hour, you know, and we had no budget, so it was coming <laughs> out of our pockets, so you yeah. know we were going to be ready. And we recorded that demo, and, you know, it, it was released in early 86. And, you know, we were like, okay, this has got to be the one that gets it. We did the same thing, kept all the promotional thing going, but it just didn't seem like it was going anywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, we were getting great response still, but n- that magic ring wasn't there. The, you know, that letter that said, hey, you know, we're interested in talking to you about a deal. So our guitarist was had really got the itch to go to California okay. and to continue to seek his musical fortune and he had also been butting heads with our vocalist a little bit Uh-oh. and I had had to talk him back into the band this is band stuff it it's, happens yeah, it does happen yeah <laughs> it's a family it's you know you got yeah. guys who are all around each other all the time yeah. and you know but this time I couldn't talk him back into the band he was just like no no I'm done you know I, I can't work with this guy you know and I'm gonna go out here anyway so at that time you know that I was like five years into it you know at that time I'm like okay I was disheartened because there didn't seem to be a deal on the horizon yeah. and uh, so I was like you know what I'm just gonna step aside too because I, I just don't have the the heart to find another guitarist and continue on this path when what we had was so good I was sure it was gonna get the deal but what we didn't know was Which that... Which you didn't know. You're some, yes. Something was going on behind the scenes, right? What we didn't know, <laughs> yes, was that a deal was actually in the works behind the scenes wow, dude. that myself and the guitarist weren't aware of. Yeah. And when we you know, had reached that point where it didn't seem like anything was going anywhere and we were just like, okay, well, I can't go on with this. We weren't told about it, you know, because at that point when we said we're going to step aside, if we were told, hey, this is in the works... We would have been, really? This is awesome. We finally made it. We finally got that point. But, you know, uh, the singer had been working with this label in Germany and uh, was offered a deal. So when that deal, you know, was fully, you know, presented, rather than calling us, he called a couple of the guys who used to be in the band Mm. back previous to to us doing any recording, except for Rob Phillips, who was the original guitarist. He was like, you know, you guys want to play? And they're like, okay. So I didn't find out about that until you know they had gone to Germany after a couple months. You know, a couple months later, I'm like, what? You know, they're they're recording well, an album. How's how's what's going on? Yeah. And six months after that, when the album came out, and I, you know, looked at a copy, and there's the ten songs of which six, you know, I had written or co-written, and oh, there wasn't a credit. My name wasn't on it anywhere. There was not a thanks anywhere on. I'm like, all right, that is not cool and oh, you know so oh. that that was that was hard that was hard you know yeah that's a tough one man it's, it's your art you know so. exactly and it would have been one thing if you know because yes i did step aside you know i wouldn't have had i known what was going on yeah but you know i did step aside but it's like okay come on now i, I wrote these songs you know at least you know say put my name on it or say thank you but i'm not the kind of person to hold on to grudges i'm not yeah. i'm genuinely not and other than the sting of that moment, you know, going on, it was fine. It was like, okay, whatever. It would have been different if that album had taken off, yeah, yeah and, and yeah. generated lots of money and fame and fortune. But it didn't. It was just, the album was put out, it was well received, and that was, that was kind of it. Doug kept Siren going with that lineup and then 
some other lineup changes down the line. But and I always try to see, like, I always try to kind of see from a distance both sides of the story and definitely understand your points. Like, oh my God, why didn't they call me? Right. And of course, I try to be, I try to be empathetic to both sides. Mm-hmm. And maybe, maybe the singer was like, well, you guys, you guys left us. So right, exactly. We did leave. Out. So yeah. there, there was probably maybe some bitterness towards you guys right. leaving or something and like that. But we've talked about that and yeah. what went down and and you know and. Like I said, that was all resolved, and you know when we got back together, which we'll talk about. Yes, you know, we're, we're coming up. That. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so you know that at that period of the band was was what it was, and you know after a few years, a few years after that, they did record one more album with a different lineup, again a completely different lineup than mm-hmm. even than even that, um, and then that was it for Siren. That was like 1989, and wow. Siren was basically you know. That was the end. Just kind of fizzled out and, and yeah. stopped. Yeah, wow. yeah, and music changed also at that time too, especially here in the United States. That's when grunge hit. So it was kind of like that was like oh, boy. A, yeah a double a double thing. So even you know with those siren had been had kept going with Doug and it was just kind of like okay. So we're gonna pretend we're back at Blockbuster and instead of rewinding, we're gonna fast forward. So Ed, before we get back into. 30 years later with the band and all that good stuff. This is about to get juicy, by the way, guys. Also, real quick, I just want to let you guys know that the links for Siren's latest album and their documentary, those links are in the YouTube description of this video, so definitely check that out. So before we get into all of that, though, I just want to ask you one question, and uh, hopefully this is an okay question to ask you. How was it not playing music, not playing drums, not doing the thing that you were so passionate about for for that period of time? How did you deal with that? How did you cope with that? You know, after after leaving the band, I, I pretty much focused on my schooling, okay. you know, and going to college. And then as you know, as soon as I got out of that, it was it was uh, you know right to working for IBM and you know IT. Wow. And yeah, I still stayed involved with music. Like I did a okay. couple projects with our now Siren guitarist Todd Grubbs um, back in the day because he's he's been a constant with music. Todd has, and um, so back then we would do you know a couple of things recording at a friend's house who had a uh, home studio at the time, an actual eight track home studio. And you know, so there were little things like that, but no bands. I was never in a band just because I just didn't really have the time or inclination to do it because it's a lot of work it's a lot of work to you know yeah you know exactly what it's like even being a relatively you know i mean one man you know operation you got to move equipment you got to arrange things you know and then generally you're there till two in the morning it's like okay it's it's a it's a (laughs) commitment it really is is, so i did little things like that you know through through that time um mostly focused on recording you know for those for those kind of projects um but i didn't really feel like there was a hole yeah. Because of that, I didn't feel like I was missing anything. My dreams of of stardom and fame, you know, those were, you know, set aside in drum cases, you know, years ago. <laughs> so they just stayed there. And as time went on, a, a good friend who is a, a now legendary producer in the area, Jim Morris, oh, yes, who yes. is from uh, Morris Sound Studios, which is just a huge studio here in in the Tampa area that is legendary for its recordings and especially metal recordings. Especially death metal, right? Yes, yeah. They kind of <laughs> set this. They set the tone, you know, for how it's done. You know how yeah. death metal is recorded. And he had come over to my place. We've been friends for throughout these years since the eighties. And he came to my place around 99 or 2000 and set me up with a home studio with a computer. And that really opened up the gates for me because it's like, okay, I understand computers, you know, at this point, that's what I do all day. So uh, I started to do my own recording. So that really filled that hole, uh, you know, if there was one of the creative gap that I had from being in a band. And I just did things for fun. Nothing, nothing ever released. I worked with the original singer of Siren, who jumped the fence with me back in 1981, That's Frank right, Marsh, yeah. and we recorded some some songs that were fun, you know, like Priest covers and originals, and because uh, he has an amazing voice. I just kept doing that. But mainly at that point, I was married. Uh, I had two daughters, and you know, it was just life, yeah. family, job. You know, my career, my career was going, you know, fine. And, you know, obviously it's a full-time, full-time thing. You know, I didn't really miss that aspect, like I said, of, of the band. And it was just kind of set aside. And that's what it was. I had this single on the wall, you know, of my own little home <laughs> studio. And it's like, that's about all it was. It was like, mm-hmm. oh, that's what I did back in 1984. There you go. 
But you stay plugged in. Though. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's refreshing to hear that because I know a lot of people that, you know, they go all out with something, whether it be music or anything, in their younger years, and they don't make it, quote unquote, which would be the deal or, or, or make it big. So they just completely fall off. Right. And so it's, it's, really, it's really encouraging to hear that, okay, so you weren't in a band and you weren't pursuing that, but you were still playing drums. You were still recording music. You oh, had yeah. your home studio. I mean, that's yeah. that's really awesome, man. Because the love of music is there. That's what yeah. never left. I mean, yeah. the dreams, you know, shuffled off they to changed. Buffalo. But yeah, <laughs> but the uh, but the the love for making music and being able to, especially as I got my home studio and yeah. was able to, you know, I learned a little bit of guitar and keys, and so I could do my own things without having to rely on dragging friends over. That's the part that I really enjoy. It's like it's like painting. I love. You know, it, yeah. it's it's layering on each new color and putting in each new track of, oh, let me put another background track or let me do this or some horns or some strings. Yeah. I love that kind of stuff. So that's what, you know, has carried me through, you know, carried me through all those years until, uh, you know, things started to happen out of the blue. Out of the blue. Of the so, blue. dude, <laughs> yes. now that like this is the ultimate question. How in the hell did this happen, man? Like, right. after 30 years, a band that, you know, I mean, you guys were playing and you guys were kind of making some momentum, but then all mm-hmm. of a sudden, poof, yeah, just gone. gone. And then all of a sudden, like, I, I don't understand this. How, tell us how this happens. <laughs> yeah, and it's crazy. And there's so many coincidences that happen along the line that it's just, un, you know, it's like, okay, is it coincidence? Is this fate? Is it what's going on here? Yeah, because yeah. stuff happened in a chain of events that was just unimaginable. Um, so starting in 2015, uh, it was late, late 2015, in the course of a month, I received probably five or six messages on Facebook from people I had never met wow. and from all around the world. It was like Russia, Germany, South America, and they all asked the same thing. They said, hey, are you Ed Aborn, the drummer of Siren? And I said, well, yeah, that, that was me because I'm the only Ed Aborn on Facebook, which yeah. you know, is easy to find. And I said, yeah, that was me. And they're like, oh, you know, I'm such a big fan. I've been a fan ever since, you know, I first got the demo, this demo or that demo. Or, and I'm like, really? Said, okay, that's cool. But, uh, and they said, oh, I, I would love to hear some story. First of all, do you have any of the original merch, you know, from back in the day? I'm like, no. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> Nothing. You know, I've got a couple <laughs> of my own copies of the single. Yeah. Um, but they said, well, I would love to ask you some questions about the band. And they asked some questions and they were all asking kind of the same things about the history of the band. And I said, you know what? You know, I'm I'm an IT nerd now. I type really fast. So I'm just going to take, you know, an evening or two and just put out everything that I remember about the formation of the band up until the point where I left at that first album. So I did. And I wrote like 33 pages of text. A book. Like single line text. <laughs> it was, I accidentally wrote a book. Yeah. And, that, and when I realized that, I was like, you know what? I've got pictures from back in the day. Let me go ahead and just scan those. I'll put it in and I'll format this into a PDF file to be an yeah. ebook. And then whoever wants to read it can read it. So I did that. And during that process, I reached out to all the, my friends, the guys from the band oh, yeah. from back in the day, which was cool to reach out to them. And I, I called and I said, you know, hey, can you take a look at this, you know, to make sure I'm remembering this correctly? Or, you know, if you've got a story you want to add, you know, please just you know send it over. And I did that, and the only person who I couldn't get a hold of during that process was um, our singer, Doug Lee. Because Doug maintains, and still maintains, a very, very low social media profile. He's just not on on social media. That's not his thing. So I couldn't find him. But I told, you know, the whole story of the, the founding of the band all the way up through, all the way up through what happened. And... You know, and I told that from my perspective, of sure, here's sure. what went on. After I finished it and sent it out to my friends, you know, like as well as the people who had asked for it, I, I sent it out to the friends who were in that circle back in the day and said, hey, here you go. Well, one of those friends, David Keyes, actually wrote back and said, hey, I'm still in touch with Doug. Oh, cool. Do you want me to send this to him? I'm like, yeah, please. You know, I, haven't, I wasn't able to find him. So he did. He passed on to Doug. And, you know, initially Doug was a little upset you know, of me sharing my side of the story and, and what happened from, you know, from my perspective. But, you know, things calmed down and we eventually started to text a little bit and, you know, kind of talk. And then we're like, hey, you want to meet for lunch? And we did. And we're like, you know, it's cool, man. We're, we're older now and everything's good. It's, everything that happened in the past is water under the bridge. Once that happened, one of those people who had reached out to me 
um, is a man named Frank Hernshaw, also known as Frank Headbanger in Germany. Mm-hmm. And he is the number one Siren fan on the planet. He's wow. just, he's, yeah, he, he loved Siren since back in the day. He loved Siren so much, he had made his own Siren license plate for the front of his car back in the 80s. He had made yeah. his own big back patch for his vest of the Siren logo. I mean, he was a huge fan back from the day. Wow. And, but we never knew him because we never had any contact with him yeah. back then. Well, you know, he is still a huge music fan and uh, always goes to all the festivals over there in Germany and is friends with some of the promoters. And he had been, you know, bugging the festival, one of these festival promoters for years saying, oh, can you please get Siren back together? You know, we want to, I want to see Siren. And the promoter of the Keep It True Festival, a man named Oliver Weinsheimer, said, listen, I'm a fan too, but we can't find Doug. You know, no, he goes, I know where Doug is. He goes, and Doug and Ed are talking. So he passed along my information to Oliver. And then, you know, he, they were like, hey, do you want to play at the Keep It True Festival? And I'm like, uh, and I <laughs> legitimately asked him, I said, is anyone going to know who we are, you know, yeah. at this, at this thing? And he said, oh yes, trust me, you have oh, a fan base that you do not realize is here. And yeah. so... You know, once we got that offer, I told Doug about it, and Doug's like, what? I don't know, man. I don't know if we can do it. We haven't been together in 30 years, and who would we ask? You know, who was going to play? So it took a month or so of just he and I talking about, is this something we should do? Can we do this, you know, without embarrassing ourselves? Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's where the process began that set us on the road to trying to, you know, decide, do we want to do this? And a quick note on Doug. I've I've met Doug mm-hmm. I've, actually a few times. We've hung out, and he's such a cool dude. By yeah. the way, I remember the first time I met him, I was at this craft beer place mm-hmm. in Brandon. Yeah, he loves craft beer. Too. Oh yeah, yeah. Just like you. And yeah. all of a sudden, my wife and her sitting there. Also, I see this dude because you and I, you know, I, I've known you since 2017, and that's I'll I'll tell that story maybe on another video. But yeah, I see this this tall guy walking up with a siren shirt. I'm like, hey, <laughs> right, right. I know the drummer yeah. of that band because I didn't know who Doug was right, at the time. Right. And he kind of looks like, uh. Yeah, I'm the singer or something <laughs> right. like that. So, yeah. But we just hit it off. So we just sat there and talked about, you know, Siren about music and just yeah. such a cool dude. Doug's such a cool dude, man. So it was yeah. really cool to meet him. Yeah, it, it was like I said. And it was, it's crazy how all these things come, you know, come about. Like, oh, I forgot to show the thing. So, yeah, so this was the... The book, yeah. The, the book. And I, I just, I had a couple copies printed. But, you know, you can see it's just pictures and all the description of what went on. Me with hair, you know, and, and you know, <laughs> just... It, you know, it was fun. It was fun to put together, but it's, you know, like I said in the foreword of that, after I had written it, I said, some stories need to be told. This is not one of them. And, you know, and that's, that's how it kind of went. But yeah. who knew that it would have launched, you know, all of this, the chain of events that then happened. Wow. Because then that's when Doug and I said, all right, let's talk to some of the people. Yeah. You know, let's talk. So we reached out to Rob Phillips, the original guitarist, but he wasn't interested in playing. And, you know, reached out to the guitarist from the Dead of Night, you know, demos, Faxon. But he was, yeah. he was still in California, which would have been impossible to do, you know, because yeah. we needed, we knew we were going to have to rehearse for months. Oh, yeah, man. To, yeah. to be able to pull up. this off and not be terrified. Um, so we eventually... Uh, I had reached out to the bass player from the Dead of Night era, Greg Culbertson, who was a great guy. But the last time I had spoken to him prior to that was back like in 2005, maybe 10 or 12 years before then. Mm. And I called him and left messages for him, but never heard back from him. So I was like, okay, well, he's totally, you know, off the grid. So we got Ed Hauser, our bass player from the Iron Coffins demo. Uh, And then, you know, uh, Hal Dunn, the the other founding guitarist. Uh, and then I wanted a ringer in there, you know, because it was like, because Siren had been a two guitarist band for a long That's time. That's right, yeah. Yeah, we were, especially yeah. back in the beginning. I knew it's like, okay, if I'm going to go on stage and feel comfortable having someone as a musical director, and the first person come to mind was Todd Grubbs. Uh, I mean, he was never in Siren, actually, but he was in bands that were the brother bands yeah, at well, the time. Was... You know, we would, and we would do, like, I played in his band for a while, you know, like for a gig. You know, oh, to cool. fill in, you know, his band Atomic Opera, which had Hal as a guitarist back then. So Atomic it was Opera, yeah. Siren and Atomic Opera. We were kind of like parallels. We got the, the unit back together. Everyone agreed that uh, we're going to do this and, you know, started started rehearsing and trying to work these old songs back up into something that would, you wow. know, sound good. 
So you guys got this lifetime opportunity to go play in Germany. And I, I want to talk about that, but just so everyone knows that everything we're talking about now and of course a lot more details and footage is in your documentary. I'm too mm -hmm. old for this shit. And we're going to talk about that in a second here. But this gig in Germany, I mean, I can't even begin to think about how that would feel for you to not have played in a band all this time. You had right. this dream when you were younger and then all of a sudden you're playing on a stage in a country that loves metal. I'm not saying U.S. doesn't love metal, but... Uh, they're on a different level. The, yeah, the German fans are definitely on the different level. Mm -hmm. So how was that, dude? Describe that to me. Oh, it, it was incredible. It, just, it, it was almost indescribable because, you know, I remember specifically as we were doing all these rehearsals and going through, you know, and there were some bumps along the way in terms of, you know, the band, which I'll touch on, which was just unexpected, no, no conflicts. Yeah. But as we were rehearsing, you know, I would rehearse almost daily myself, just playing, you know, playing through the songs on my own, in my own house. And I made it a point while I was doing that to play and just close my eyes and imagine what's that going to be like to see, you know, thousands of people in front of me, because it, I'd never, I'd never had that opportunity before. Mm. <laughs> and and I, I wanted to kind of visualize it. So one, it wouldn't be as terrifying, you know, as it could be. Yeah. And two, I wanted to make a point to tell myself that, listen, when you're there, when you're in that moment, realize it and pull yourself back. Don't just rush through it, but realize it and look at those people and remind yourself that what you're going through right now, what you're doing is the dream that you had. And it's the dream that you had when you were 13, 15, 20, you know, that you're living it. And take that moment, you know, even, you know, while it's going on so it doesn't go by in a blur and enjoy it, you know, just be mindful of it. And, uh, and I did. So that mo I remember specifically, it was while we were playing the song Dead of Night. And I had written the lyrics for that song back in the day. And I remember looking out and I'm playing and there are thousands of people dead of night, you know, and singing some of the lyrics back from the verses. And I'm like, <laughs> I step back. I'm like, dude, this is going on. There yeah. are, you know, thousands of people, you know, listening to the music that you wrote back in the day and loving it now, you know? So even if this is just a moment in time, mm -hmm. it's an incredibly sweet moment in time, you oh, know, and, man. and one I'll never forget. So that was just mind blowing the whole experience and then going over and experiencing the country and experiencing the fans and meeting them. Yeah. Uh, Cause I know like another highlight of the whole experience was uh, at Keep It True, it's a two day festival and they have a pre-show party the night before okay. the first day of the festival. And uh, I remember meeting a fan named Stefan Bernard who was a great guy and he's actually you see him in the documentary you'll you'll when you see it you'll know exactly who I'm talking about yeah. and he was so excited for us to be there i mean he was like frank but he was just like so excited and as he was describing what it meant for us to be there it was like i was almost going to tear up because it was like here is this man who had said you know you know i have been waiting for this moment you know since i was a teenager he goes it's like, I feel like it's Christmas morning for me. It's like, dude. you know, he, and he said, it's my dream for you to be here. And I'm like, dude, I said, this is our dream, <laughs> you know, to, yeah. to be here. You know, we didn't even know that you existed. You know, we didn't know we had fans, let alone fans that held on for decades yeah. to see us. And that moment was just so heartfelt on his part and touched me and made me realize even before we performed that this is something beyond just going and playing our music. Yes. It was something that meant not only something to us, but something to the people, you know, a lot of the people who were there. That, and that was an amazing part of the documentary, by the way. Uh, I've watched yeah. it twice, and it's, uh, it's really good. And again, we're definitely going to get to that. But dude, I, I want to now talk about some of the latest music. So before okay. we get to Back From The Dead, which was released in 2020, mm -hmm. which I can't say enough great things about. Thank you, man. I mean, it's, it's, and we'll get to that, but you guys did a release in 2018. Tell me about that. That's right. And actually, um, that's part of this whole story, too, that just gets crazy. Yeah. Because when we were announced that we were going to play at the Keep It True Festival, that we're going to reunite for this show, we had a couple of, well, I had a handful, actually, 
of labels, independent labels, reach out to us with the deal that we never had. The deal, yes. <laughs> um, and say, hey, we want to put together an anthology package of your early demos and the first album, and if you have any unreleased material, extras, and we're like, really? That's uh, oh, okay. And and I've I've given this this analogy before. It's like you know, if playing the festival was like the cake and having an unexpected cake baked for you, you know, yeah. um, it's like okay, now we're gonna put some icing on that cake because Man. who gets a an anthology package from a band that was gone for thirty years? you know, put together for them. And what this package turned out to be was just incredible. I mean, wow. uh, there were two labels. Uh, the first was Storm Spell Records, who put out uh, just an amazing, uh, yeah, double CD set uh, that, you know, has over two hours worth of music and this big 24-page booklet that 24 has... 24 pages? Oh, it's huge, yeah. It's like, a, <laughs> it's like a book, and especially when you see the text size in this. Dude. But lots of pictures and... And it's just amazing, you know, triple package. You can see the demos. There's our, you know, cassette demos and the original single, the first album. So it was just an amazing, you know, package. But then uh, Underground Power Records in Germany put out a massive vinyl package for oh, this. Wow. Yeah, an anthology. It was triple vinyl, so three full LPs, and a replica of our single, a total replica of the single. Uh, as well as they also threw in an extra, like a slip mat for the turntable, you know, inside yeah, the yeah. package. It's like, okay, this is just <laughs> nuts. So, you know, that was incredible to have happen, just to, yeah. to have that package. And while we were doing that, while, while that, we were still rehearsing and getting, you know, ready for the show, we decided to, we were like, you know what, let's go ahead and record a couple new songs yes. to be included in this. Because if somebody's putting out a record, let's at least show, hey, this is what we sound like now. And uh, so we did that. We re we recorded the song Dead of Night because Dead of Night had never appeared on an album. Oh, okay. So we recorded a new version of Dead of Night and then three new, completely original, you know, new songs uh, and had such a great time doing that. And we were really happy with the way they came out. And when we went over to the festival, the, the you know, these packages, the CD package and the, the, the triple vinyl package, you know, were, were ready because that's what they wanted to have them ready for the festival. They sold out immediately oh, through, you wow. know, the, I mean, which was incredible. I mean, the, the people who had, who had made them were even like, yeah, we've not seen this happen. And, you know, it was so exciting because that means, you know, people were anxious to see us and they were welcoming us and buying stuff, you know, our, our stuff. Um, so... After we had done the festival, we were like, you know what? We've had such a great time. We've had, it's been an amazing experience. And we had a great time working together to record new songs, to write and record new songs. Let's, let's just do an album. You know, we, we can do it ourselves. Yeah. So let's go ahead and record a full album. So that's what we set our minds to do after that. And we spent 2019 recording uh, the new album. Which is right here, coincidentally. Back from the dead, yes. yeah. Back from the dead, and it's uh, it's also on Underground Power Records, the vinyl, and on the CD, it's uh, FHM Records, and it's out. And the first runs sold out, you know, of, from everything. Now they're in their second pressing of the vinyl, and uh, the second pressing of the CDs, from what I understand, from FHM have just come out. So, which is crazy, you know, in itself. But yeah, we just had such a great time, you know, that we figured it's not about fame, it's not about fortune, it's about fun. Yeah. It's And it's about enjoying every opportunity that we've had and the fact that we can still do it. And just being grateful for all those things. Like I said, one more cherry on the cake of the experience. And if it ends tomorrow, then it's been amazing. But, you know, we're just gonna enjoy every opportunity that comes up. Yeah. In this album, I'll tell you guys, I mean, again, the links are in the YouTube description of this video, so definitely check that out. One thing I'll say about this album, though, it was a breath of fresh air for me, because you guys you. stayed true to the 80s heavy metal, to that just that true classic heavy metal, melodic metal style, yeah. but it's not by any means dated material. Yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely a representation of, here's the new siren, here's where right. you guys are at now in your life, Right, and it's just I don't know. It's it's, it's great. <laughs> it's Thank awesome you, man. Album. Well, you're you, we absolutely aimed for that. 
Yeah. We aim to stay true to our roots, to stay true to our influences of priest, maiden, except, yeah. but we also wanted to show where our own musical journeys had taken us over the past 30 years yeah. and, you know, and tie in those influences. But the, but the meat of the music is definitely based on our initial music. So when you hear it, you know, it's, it's a very natural progression between what we did back in the day, but sounding better and more mature maybe is a good word yeah. for it. But what ties it all together is Doug Lee. It's it's his voice. His, his voice, yeah. His voice is so <laughs> unique yeah. in in terms of his tone and delivery that uh, it's been the constant thread through all of our music. So even though our music is now still heavy and melodic, a little touch of prog here and there, but you know his voice is what makes it a siren song. Yeah. You know, and we were just thrilled. And and writing together, we were able to really focus on pulling everyone's strengths. And putting everyone's strengths on the album, you know, be it the guitars, you know, the bass, you know, anything. Oh, and I forgot to to touch on the fact. Speaking of bass, that Greg Culbertson, the bassist from, um, uh, you know, our Dead of Night demos, actually came back into the fold unexpectedly when Ed Hauser, the bass player we had been working with for months, had to step aside unexpectedly oh, during this right. process. That was a big, you know. Uh, hurdle that we had to overcome because you know ed came to us and said listen i'm gonna have to have back surgery two weeks before the show oh dude and because he wow. had served in the military as a helicopter yeah. pilot for a decade like a, a couple decades and ret and had retired but his back was so jacked up from that experience that it was just you know he was really yeah. struggling with it as we went on as we were preparing and then about a month before he stepped aside is when greg called me back after 12 years and yeah and and it was like hey man what's going on i'm like you're not gonna believe what's going on yeah. and uh you know so when ed did come to us and say he was going to step aside we're like okay what are we going to do um and that's when i went over to see greg to say you know hey man you know i've been telling you about what's going on well here's now what's going on um so greg is now you know a part of this and really that's a another fulfillment of a dream is that uh the band that we had with Greg and myself and Doug, yeah. we never got to be on an album together. And now, you know, we've this got to, to live that and, and have it and have it be well received, which is really cool. Wow. And for Ed, thank you for your service in the military. I Absolutely. Guess I highly respect that. Uh, now, yeah, I will say the thing about Doug is his voice, like you said, there's no one that sounds like him and you can tell he's not trying to sound like anyone else. No. And that's the trap a lot of singers can fall into. It's like, well, these bands, this is the going thing right now, so I need to kind of fit that genre. But right. he just sounds like Tug Lee, and there's he, he can't yeah. be replicated. So yeah, yeah it's it, he really does, and it's the tone of his voice and the delivery. I mean, if I yeah. had to, if if somebody asked me, well, just give me someone he sounds like. Yeah, try. I would say a little bit Ozzy, and you know, mixed with the attitude of Dave Mustaine from Megadeth, because he's got kind of a Get sneering kind of yeah, that edge, yeah. that tone that really puts the emotion into the delivery of the lyrics. Um, but you know, you could listen to, you know, when like the anthology package, you can listen to this stuff, you know, the very, from the very first single to the new material that were recorded for the anthology. And it's like, sounds like the same band. They just sound yeah. stronger. Yeah, it does sound a lot stronger. And again, it's an amazing album. I listened to the whole thing back to back as I was writing the notes for, yeah, cool. for our interview here last weekend. And I was like, man, this is awesome. And that's one, one final thing I'll say is there's no what you call skippers or fillers. Remember okay. back in the day, it's like yeah. a band would have like two or three hit songs or whatever. And then the rest of the album's like, okay, let me uh, yeah. skip past this one. You, you guys don't have any of that on here, man. Every, Thanks, every man. Uh, nothing is... Um, I want to say nothing is like, there's no pressure. There was no pressure to make this album. And I think it goes back to what you said earlier. Music is your passion. Right. And you, you had fun putting this album together. There was no pressure from a label telling you had to sound a certain way. Exactly. And it wasn't forced. You know what I mean? You, just, you guys oh, yeah. just produced the music that you wanted to write and produce. So Absolutely. on that note, the writing for this record. So mm -hmm. how did, did one person write the song or a few people or did everybody pitch in a little bit? How did that go? Um, everyone pitched in. That was the thing. It was always an open slate. You know, everyone okay. could contribute. So that's awesome. So everyone did. I wrote the lyrics for a song. I tweaked a couple things. Um, Hal, our guitarist, is it's interesting because Hal, our guitarist, has a very distinct style. He's a very yes, he classic, yeah. you know, um, pedal pedaling kind of style. Yeah. And uh, Todd is a little more uh, esoteric 
with the guitar because he's also been the one who has been a professional musician throughout this whole time yeah. and having a music school. So he's a lot more uh, educated. He went to Berkeley. I mean, he's, you know, oh, well, yeah. yeah. And so he his palette is a lot wider in terms of his what he can do. Yeah. And so you mix that all up, you know, and it, it was just, it was great to see it come together. Like Hal would write a riff and then Todd would, would you know, write the pre-chorus and chorus and, you know, then they'd all come together. Um, Todd wrote a lot of the songs, a lot of the, the riffs and lyrics, actually, because he's just great. You know, he's just really, really good. And we were all, you know, it wasn't a, a, a situation where, you know, he'd write something and put it out and we'd be like, okay, yeah, that's that's pretty good. It was like, yeah. this is great. And if we had the the freedom to say, no, nah, I'm not feeling that one. You okay. know, I'm not feeling this riff or I'm not feeling this. But it happened so infrequently. You know, I, I acted as kind of like the producer because I was doing the mixing and pulling everything together, all the pieces and doing the extras. And there were some times, though, I kid him because there were some times, you know, he would add a lead to something and I'd be like, yeah, I'm not feeling this no. one, man. I'm not, I'm sorry. <laughs> and it was funny because it talks about how I always love to destroy his ego, um, but he's incredibly talented. So it was, it was very much a, uh, you know, a joint experience. That's good. Um, but I would say that, you know, Todd definitely did the bulk of the lifting just because he was in such a groove yeah. after spending, you know, a year at that point of soaking in Siren's music and understanding what makes a Siren song that when we came time to be, let's start writing an album, he was just, you know, he was already on the track going at full speed and started laying it out. So we would get together, write some stuff all together. Sometimes he would write stuff individually, you know, and riffs and, and, and put out, arrange a song. And it just came together very naturally. Awesome, awesome, man. So now, next, I want to talk about this documentary. I love saying this, too. I'm too old for this shit, because <laughs> sometimes walking up the stairs to my studio, I'm like, man, I'm too old for this shit, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so this documentary, for one, it was produced by <laughs> iconic Chris Jericho. Mm -hmm. Dude, so how did that even come about for him to produce this? Like, are you guys friends, or did you just meet, or how did that come about? Yeah, actually, Chris and I are friends. Okay. And cool. we've known each other for around 20 years, um, oh, wow. and it was about, about 16 at that point. So we had actually met at church okay. one day, and it was after church, and I had approached him. I knew who he was. Um, it was just before he was going from WCW to WWF at the time. And I was a fan of wrestling, but not a big fan. I was when I was a kid, but... Um, but I knew that Jericho was a huge lover of metal yes. and a huge lover. That's where he got his name. He got his name, Chris Jericho, from the Halloween album Walls of Jericho. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And nice. um, I knew we had that in common. And also that we also both loved horror movies, yeah. especially 80s horror movies, which are the best. Those are uh, the best, dude. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so I, I, I went up to him after church and I said, hey, you know, how you doing? And introduced myself. And I said, listen, I think we like a lot of the same bands. And I started to rattle off some of these bands like Halloween and, you know, some of these more obscure bands, not the, the mainstream right, you know, right. ones. And he was like, wow. So it wasn't just a guy coming up saying, you know, I'm a big fan. Are you going to beat the rock? You know, it wasn't that. It was a guy who comes up, just an old guy and says, hey, I think we love both this obscure metal together. And we became friends and it just kind of grew from there because we both live here in the area, Tampa. And, uh, you know. In the years that ensued, did a lot of things together. I helped with the band Fozzy in a lot of ways, um, and just you know, just good friends. So uh, when all this started to happen with the the band being asked to play the festival, yeah, you know, we were just talking one day, and I said, "Man, listen, you're not going to believe this, but my band from back in the day, Siren, has been asked to play this festival in Germany." And he goes, "What?" He goes, "Wait, yeah, you know, okay." Because I had to refresh him, you know, that I was yeah. in a band back in the day. Because it wasn't something that came up. It was like right. we all had our bands. He had Scimitar, that was his band in high school, and I had Siren, and you know, we all had that. But it was in the past. And he said, "Dude," he goes, "Okay, okay. I don't mean to be rude, but you know, is anyone going to care?" And I said, "That's exactly <laughs> what I said to the promoter. Is anyone going to care? Is anyone yeah. going to recognize us?" And he, the promoter, has assured me that there will be people who, you know, who know our music. And he's like, oh, wow. He, he just couldn't believe it. He goes, this doesn't happen that your high school band, no. all of a sudden, you know, the band from your youth gets called to play a festival 
because you don't realize you have a big following in a different country. And I said, that that's what's going on. And I laid out, you know, here's where we are. We're just we've got the band kind of together. And now we're starting to practice and pull this, you know, together to, to go play the festival. So we moved on. And uh, the next day he calls me back and says, listen, man, he goes, I can't, I can't get this out of my head. This whole thing. He said, I was thinking about this and, you know, whether or not you guys go and the wheels fall off and it becomes a train wreck or you go and it's the most triumphant, you know, feel good story. It's a great story. It's and it's a something, story, yeah. yeah, I would want to see either way, either way this goes. And uh, he goes, what would you think if I financed uh, a documentary to be made about this where I'll send a film crew <laughs> down and they can interview you and catch you as you're rehearsing and you know, getting ready to do this, and then I'll pay for them to go to Germany with you. And I'm like, dude, what? You know, I'm like, <laughs> I said, well, you know what, man? I said, so many things have happened now along the way. I, I just accept when these things You can't happen. say no. I mean, yeah. Dude, yeah. I was like, and I said, if the worst comes to worst, we're going to have the best home movie ever for yeah. us to watch ourselves, and, you know, we can relive it. And uh, so that's how it started, and he um, got the a filmmaker named Nathan Mowry, young man he's like 27 he had done their judas video oh, awesome. which now has like 45 million views or Dude. something on youtube and he's such a talented such a talented guy and so he was the one that came down and you know had uh, always had an apprentice you know a, a assistant with him and started to interview us started to interview guys who used to be in the area back in the day to kind of build what is going on and how we got to this point and then he came with us to germany and filmed the entire experience as it happened and wow. you know then did a masterful job at taking those hundreds of hours of footage Dude. and telling the heart of the story what really went down and thankfully it was not a dumpster fire train wreck you know it, <laughs> it ended up being the, the triumphant one definitely um, was yeah and then he and chris worked together tightly because chris is a, just a genius when it comes to yeah. entertainment to pick the parts of that experience as we went through it that told the story and that's what's you know came out in the film. In the first time we saw it, we were blown away. We're like, we live this, and it's making me you know almost tear up in a couple of places just because of the experience. Yeah, it, it, even for someone that's not I me, mean, for you especially, you mm -hmm. know, it, it's it's that. But even for someone like me, uh, of course, I didn't know about Siren back in the day. I only knew about it from meeting you right. several years ago. Uh, but just watching the documentary, like I I could feel the power and the emotion coming from that Absolutely. in those moments. Um, the funniest moment though was when Doug lost his passport. <laughs> yeah, there were. I mean, great. you know, there were challenges. That you know, part oh, yeah. of this that Chris realized too was that touring is not easy. You know, you're talking about a group of guys who have never done it, not even in a in a in a light fashion. He he told he told us, and you can see it in the movie. He admits it during that time. He's like, I can't see this going well. It does not happen. It does. If everything goes well well for them, I'll be amazed. And there were bumps and there were there were roadblocks and yeah. you know because we didn't we didn't know how to travel internationally. We didn't know how to travel and you know what gear are we bringing? What are we doing? How are we getting from point A to point B? Yeah. And we have one of the things that happened. Just one of those moments was we're getting ready to leave uh, Frank where we were staying with Frank Headbanger. You know yeah. uh, before sure. the show because we spent uh, four or five days in Germany to do to enjoy the country. To do some sightseeing and just really enjoy it courtesy of frank you know and his family and uh so we were all packed up ready to head to where the festival was the part of the country the festival was and you know we're in this mercedes van and it's just loaded to the gills because we've got nine people and then you know, all the gear stuffed into the back I mean, you can't we tetris this thing in you can't you know <laughs> put a business card in there oh man and i'm kind of like the dad of the band i guess that's because i'm you know i've just raised my daughters and I'm used to that being yeah. in that mode of okay does everyone have everything and literally we're getting ready to back out I'm like okay everybody got your gear got your bags got your passports and everyone's going around you know verifying that and I'm like hearing nothing from Doug except for oh God, <laughs> you know I'm like Doug <laughs> you know he's like oh, I can't find my passport I know I got it though and I'm like okay all right I wait a few minutes he's still looking he's like oh I know I've got it. I just, I just had it. And so we're like, okay, everybody out. So we had to unpack the whole band. Well, that whole event took around 45 minutes, which you see pared down <laughs> to around three in the movie. But it was, it just turned out hilarious. Cause you know, I didn't realize it until we saw the movie that he must've said, 
over the course of this like 10 times like it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> looking over here, it doesn't make any sense. And he's looking and we're looking and we had to unpack everything and oh, then he goes into conspiracy theories about maybe somebody walked by and picked it up and it's like, "Doug, we're the only ones here. We're on a neighborhood street." <laughs> And that was great. You know, I, I won't spoil it, but yeah, uh, don't it, spoil it, 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 it was it, it was the only time where I kind of I I actually looked at the camera because we got very used to the cameras being there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we you know there's no acting going going on in this, but but Nathan and the other filmmaker you know, who were there, they became our friends because we're yeah. traveling as a group and we've known them now for months. And I just look at the camera like, really. <laughs> You know, <laughs> that was and, great dude, yeah, yeah, and it was, uh, but it was that was just one of those moments where you know we're not used to that. We're not used to making sure all of our passports are yeah. accounted for and this this kind of thing, and you know, and there were other speed bumps here and there, but overall, it was just you know it turned out to be an amazing experience, yeah. and it was captured, which I which I love. That is beautiful, yeah. It, that, and again, guys, those links for the documentary and their latest album, they're in the YouTube description. Uh, Ed, I've got a couple more questions for you before okay. we close out here. And um, these are really important questions. And this okay. is one question I know all you guys watching right now are probably wondering. So after 30 years, you guys get back together. Mm -hmm. You release this awesome new album. You got this awesome documentary. Everything just seems to be happening. Documentary. Yep, there it is. This, this documentary. Is the Blu-ray, which you can buy, Blu-ray, DVD. Not from us. It's just on Amazon. And it's also streaming on all the platforms, Amazon, Voodoo, right. Sling, wherever you stream stuff. So all that said, all mm -hmm. this awesome stuff, what's next for Siren? Well, it goes back to kind of basically what our attitude is about all this. Okay. And, you know, whether you want to call it disbelief or just pure gratitude that, um, you know, it's different. You know, when, when this happened, and the only thing I can equate it to uh, especially it's like you know, talking about the movie you know the movie's not about siren it's not about heavy metal it's about what happens when a dream sneaks up on you yeah that's really what happens and that was captured in the film it's like you get to watch that happen to us and because everyone has a dream we all yeah. dreamt to be at the top of the mountain whatever our mountain was was it whether it was pitching for the Yankees or whether it was being in the New York Ballet you know it's just we all had that dream, and then we, most of us, the vast, vast majority of us, have to put it aside to live. And we go about our lives and have careers and families. And um, so, so our whole attitude with this has been one of, let's just take the, this for what it is. Yeah. And, you know, the dream was much different back when we were 20 years old. The dream back then was to get to the top of that mountain, to to experience the fame and fortune and everything that goes with it, the as deal. Freddie Mercury would say. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, but now it's not. It's not, you know, our, it's not really about a dream now. We don't really have a dream. Now we're just actually living experiences that are just incredible. You know, like to be able to have played the festival, to have an album, to have two albums, you know, out now, and now the documentary film. So each new thing that comes along is just we take it for the opportunity that it is and we appreciate it. So our plans right now are really just to, uh, you know, see what happens with the documentary. Like, and it's been great so far because just the comments that come in, how people are touched by it and how it does exactly what we talked about. It resonates with them oh, it does. based on their dream. The yeah. dream. Their dream didn't have to be music. It didn't have to be anything, even fame or fortune. But we, we've seen comments where people are picking up instruments that they haven't touched in years where they've decided awesome. to start painting, you know, uh, you know, again, because it's like, you know, you're never too old. Yeah. You're never too old to, despite the title, you're never too old to, uh, to do something you love. And that's what we're doing right now is we're doing something we love and we're doing it, you know, as a group. So putting out music, putting out the albums, our hope, you know, is that maybe we get the chance to play again somewhere we were actually supposed to play in the summer of 2020 that's right back in germany but with the the pandemic yeah. and that everyone got sidetracked yeah. um but we're hoping that we get a chance you know if to we will play anywhere where they get us to the show basically is, is pretty much what it comes down to because you know we're so un diva like it's just like we just want to play and, just and there, yeah. that if we want to be there as a fan we want to come to the show and, we'll, and then we also get to play hey great but uh, so that's really where we're at is just appreciating everything that's been and 
uh, hoping that you know maybe get a chance to play a little more, you know, or that people enjoy watching and coming along with us for the experience that we lived. That's an awesome outlook to have on that, you know, and and you kind of like touched on the the final question I, I wanted to ask you is, you know, what would you say to I don't want to call us older. I mean, I'm in my mid forties, and you're you're what thirty something. Yeah, mid fifties. Yeah, thirty something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if only. Yeah. Oh man, but no, you know, you know, older guys like us, and yeah. um, you know, because even on my YouTube channel, there's there's some guys that are in their you know forties, fifties, sixties, even seventies that have just picked up guitar, and you know, I I'm ecstatic to hear about that. But what would your message be to the people? And I think there's a lot of people out there like this that they had that dream when they were younger, mm -hmm. like you said, with it been music or, or whatever it was, but they had that dream and it just never did happen. And maybe you kind of carry some bitterness over the years that that didn't happen for you and, and you feel like that you've settled for a life that you really don't want. You're just kind of existing. What, you know, what's, what's a message you would have for someone like that, Ed? Uh, I would say, you know, it's, we all have expectations and expectations for ourselves change as time yeah. goes by. When we're young, it's easy to have those lofty, lofty expectations. And as we get older, that's when, as you mentioned, sometimes when those things don't happen, that that disappointment or the bitterness kind of creep in. And unfortunately, sometimes it leads to people stop doing what they love and they lose touch with why they picked it up in the first place. Generally, the first time somebody picks up a guitar, it's not with the sole intention of, I am going to be absolutely rich and famous. That is why I'm doing this. Yeah. It's not. It's like they pick up a guitar and it makes some noise. And then they start to learn the craft. And they, they start to enjoy it and feel that connection of creation, of making that music. And you know what? That's the part that never had to leave. And that was you know, what I experienced in my own life is that, is that you don't have to stop doing something you love just because your initial expectation didn't come to pass. Right. So like you say, you know, the guitarists that are on your channel, because I'm, I'm one of the ones on your channel. I'm a functional guitarist. Yeah, I'm not yes, a, you are, yeah. I'm not a guitarist guitarist. Like I, I, but watching you, and I've, I've had this conversation with friends of mine too. When people watch someone like you play they're and, and they're in the position like myself where we, we want to get better, um, you know, you can have one of two reactions. You can either look at that and say, I can never get there. I, that's just beyond, I know I can never get there. Or you can look at it and say, I may not get there, but I can look at some stuff and hear some stuff and get closer to that and make myself better. Yeah. And that's what I would say to those people. It's like, it doesn't matter how old you are, you know, do something for the love of doing it and for the, for the, the passion that you have with sole expectation of enjoying it yourself. You know, because if you can create something and then listen back to it or look at it or whatever, whatever it is you've created and just feel the pride of knowing that you brought something into the world that didn't exist before. Yes. That's what it's about. And you don't have to be, you know, at the top of the mountain to do that. You can be well on the bottom, you know, and just put out something great that you love. If you decide to share it with the world, you know, it's easier than ever these days to do that. If, you, oh, yeah, if yeah. you want to release something musically that you've done or artistically that you've done, you know, it's a push of a button and usually $20 and it's available <laughs> to the world. Yeah. And that's something that we never had before. That's and true. then, you know, you may not have millions of people, you know, just fawning over what you've done, but there'll probably be a few, even if it's friends and family. Yeah. You'll have people who appreciate what you do just for the sake that you've made something, that you created something. And that's the point, the part I would say, don't ever let go of that. You know, no matter what your skill level or what you think you can do, just do it, you know, and do it and do it for the sake of enjoying it. And it will be worthwhile and you will have won before you even started. Those are wise words, man. And that's oftentimes, you know, some of what I tell my audience here is, that, you know, you don't have to even compare yourself to someone, even if someone's at a certain level uh, and you feel like you'll never get there. It's okay. Go your own path, and don't yes. necessarily try to sound like someone else or be like someone else. You know, you can take bits and pieces and learn from that, but work on developing your own style and, and getting as good as you possibly can. Absolutely. And then your own style, your signature tone and style, would will, will develop through that. Right, and don't don't always compare yourself, especially yeah, to true. your heroes or to people who are just incredibly talented that you just 
wish you could do that, you know, because that comparison uh, is, is, you know, it doesn't do you any good, you know, you know, that's true, you know, but just use that as, you know, to lift yourself, to lift yourself higher and then take advantage of all the opportunities. Cause that's another thing, man. I know you know this back in the day, we did not have the ability to watch somebody do all of these incredible things now like that you do and have people show us how to do it. That's true. Yeah. We could we'd put on an album and listen to it and pick the needle up and put it back. <laughs> and listen yes. to it and nah, no it was zzz, nah. okay. Didn't get it. Yeah, nope. And now the like you see, you know, kids playing Van Halen and oh, yeah. every you know, and that they're not awesome. necessarily prodigies, they're great, but everyone now has the opportunity to stand on the shoulders of giants. Oh, yes. because that's you know we all have the opportunity to learn and that goes across no matter what it is you want to learn if you want to learn guitar that's why you're here you know you can be inspired and and see how you do it and what you're doing you know if you want to learn you know any kind of creative expression youtube and you've, you're going to find somebody doing it and explaining it in a way that makes it attainable and that's something that i think we all have access to and you know we got to take advantage of that let's use it yeah well, Ed, it has been an absolute pleasure to have Thank you, you man. here, it's, man. It's I been really... a total, total pleasure and honor because, like I said, I'm a fan, and he blows me away with, you know, I, I watch him, and I fight with that same fight of like, oh, oh what he's doing makes me want to pick up my guitar. Oh, oh now <laughs> I want to put it back down again. But it's like, okay, just take a little bit of it. So, yeah, man. <laughs> and I wish you the best success. I love seeing your trajectory because, you know, you, you are putting in the work, and people are recognizing that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Guys, again, you can get Siren's latest album, Back from the Dead, and their documentary produced by Chris Jericho. I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> A heavy metal fairy tale. Yes, I love it, man. Uh, there are links to that in the description of this YouTube video. Guys, thank you so much for watching and all the support you give my channel. Until next time, keep it metal. Yes, yes. Thank you. I know, I know exactly. I get and beard dancing. Oh, do I do, too. I actually yeah. use... Uh, Head, head shoulders, shoulders. Yep. Yeah, my beard. My, my dermatologist, yeah, told me that. I'm like, I never thought about that. But you know, yeah, and since I did, it's like, oh, cool. Works. I have no dandruff today. Exactly, man. So you no dandruff. Yes. <laughs> head <laughs> and do, shoulders. We do our commercial, yes, exactly. We could. <laughs> head and shoulders. Maybe I'll put that at the end of the bit as a <laughs> Yeah, link to head and shoulders. <laughs>